Hello, and welcome to a brief overview of the literary movements of British and Irish literature. In this video, we'll be taking a look at three different things. First off, what the literary movement is and roughly when it took place, then the characteristics of it, including a major work that I feel like epitomizes it, and finally, since I teach in the United States, where most students first take American literature before taking British and Irish, I'll be sharing the American equivalent for anyone who is interested. Also, if this is your first time on the channel, be sure to check out some of my other videos where I go into more detail about some of the works that are mentioned here and many that aren't. Middle Ages, Old English. So as you can see here, I start this genre in around the year 500 AD. Now I want to be very clear that stories have existed as long as people have existed. And wherever there's been people, there's been a literary tradition of sorts. However, most of what was before 500 AD has been lost to history, at least the direct stories. So that's why we usually talk about British and Irish literature starting around 500. So the Romans were there earlier, the Celts were there even earlier, as well as other natives to the Isles, but the Anglo-Saxons were the first ones whose stories survived antiquity. So there's this combination of the early myth with the new Christianity, and you really see a lot of that in the most famous work from this time, which is Beowulf. So Beowulf is a poem and poetry dominates at this time. Beowulf is the oldest poem in the English language. However, it is in Old English, so I, as a native English speaker trying to read the original Beowulf text, would only understand a couple of words here or there. In fact, a native German speaker might have a better chance at actually understanding it. But it is still English. I personally love Seamus Haney's translation from the early 90s but Tolkien did a translation as well as a number of other scholars. And Beowulf is very influential today, even though for many centuries it was kind of lost and no one read it, uh, it has become quite popular and well-read. At this time in the United States of America, you have Native American hieroglyphics and the oral tradition of their stories. Middle Ages, Middle English. So Old English pretty much transitions into Middle English with the arrival of the Normans. And a big shift for modern readers is that we can actually understand it without translation. Sometimes it can be quite difficult, but you can figure it out given enough time and a helpful dictionary or glossary to help you with some of the terms that have disappeared. But in Middle English we really see the foundation of what we think of as English nowadays. And that's why Geoffrey Chaucer, the author of Canterbury Tales, one of the most foundational works of this time period, is sometimes thought of as the father of the English language. Likewise, in the United States, we still have the Native American tradition. No other arrivals in the United States at this time. Maybe the Vikings, but who knows. English Renaissance Elizabethan. So here we see the time period start to narrow a little bit. We're not seeing vast centuries. Uh, we're seeing a very small portion of time, all things considered, just about 50 years here. And this is zeroing in on Queen Elizabeth's reign. And at this time, poetry and plays are starting to uh, take shape. Um, even though the plays are still very verse-based, so they're, they have a lot in common with poetry, plays are really, really popular. You have Christopher Marlowe, William Shakespeare, Ben Jonson, all sorts of famous playwrights operating at this time. And these playwrights and poets are becoming professional literary people. Geoffrey Chaucer was a famous poet, but he was also working in the government and working different clerical jobs at that time. It's only now where we start to see writers who are just writing and able to make a living through it. In the United States, we have the arrival of Puritan literature, Anne Bradstreet being one of the most famous writers in that tradition. And even though I'm not going to be mentioning Native American literature anymore in the US, it is still going on to this day. It doesn't stop just because the Europeans arrive. Uh, but usually, unfortunately, when we're studying it in school, we do stop studying Native American literature once the Europeans arrive. So that's a shift that us over here in the United States need to make. But for now, just as a disclaimer, know that much like England, the United States has a many different cultures writing at, at different times. English Renaissance Jacobean so the shift from Elizabethan to Jacobean is just a change in ruler. 
However, there is a little bit of a difference um, in this time period. The works tend to get a little bit darker. Uh, this is the end of Shakespeare's career as a writer. However, he has some of his most famous works, like Macbeth and King Lear. And then there's some other really substantial works, especially from Ben Jonson, and the King James Bible is published. So that is where most people are familiar with this era, is they might have heard verses from the King James Bible. So we're still in Middle English, and if you're thinking, well, how hard is it to read and understand Middle English? If you think of Shakespeare or you think of the King James Bible, you'll get an understanding of what Middle English sounds like, at least written out. In the United States, we still have Anne Bradstreet and Puritan literature. English Renaissance Metaphysical Poets So this movement is different from all the rest on this list because it wasn't a unified movement. These poets, uh, John Donne, Andrew Marvel, and others, uh, they overlapped with other movements. They were not a united group. In fact, they weren't even called metaphysical poets till after they were done writing, when Dr. Samuel Johnson called them metaphysical poets as an insult. He especially disliked their use of what's called conceits, which are long, elaborate metaphors. So if you've ever read The Sun Rising by John Donne, the entire thing is a metaphor where the sun is an unwelcomed guest, an intruder, but then becomes a welcome guest, and there's some like rivalry between the speaker and the sun. And the whole poem basically follows one big metaphor. So for a long time, the metaphysical poets were popular but scoffed at, and it wasn't really until T.S. Eliot, many hundreds of years after their life, where people started to really appreciate them for their artwork, and it is some of the most beautiful poetry uh, that you'll ever read. So check them out uh, if you've never heard of them before. Still in the United States, we have the good old Puritan literature. Enlightenment. So the Enlightenment is a huge movement, not just in literature. In fact, it's usually not thought of as a very strong literary movement. There's a lot going on in the sciences and philosophy at this time, but there is some literature as well. A uh, big writer at this time is Dr. Samuel Johnson, a very memed man nowadays. <laughs> you, would, you would love that. Um, there's a real focus on reason and order, and fiction really falls out of favor for political and philosophical thought. And when you think of how important reason and order are to them, it should come as no surprise that one of the seminal works from this time period is a dictionary, uh, Dr. Samuel Johnson's A Dictionary of the English Language. So as opposed to plays where fantastical or irrational things are happening on stage, you have essays and dictionaries being written. In the United States, we also call this the Enlightenment, and a big part of our Enlightenment is revolutionary writings. So you might think of the Declaration of Independence as one of the biggest Enlightenment writings in the United States. Romanticism. Romanticism is one of my favorite areas to study. It is mostly a reaction to the Enlightenment, and I'm not going to go into a lot of detail with that. Uh, I have another video that I'll link up above that actually talks about these two movements uh, together and how the Enlightenment transitioned into Romanticism. But for now, just some basics with it, is the Enlightenment was very focused on the mind, and Romanticism was rebelling against that, reacting to it, and so it focused on the heart, on emotion. Uh, emotion, nature, beauty were all more important than reason. And we see an explosion of beautiful fiction at this time, and horrifying fiction as well. Poems, plays, although not plays like Shakespeare's plays, there's a lot of famous what were called closet dramas, which were plays that were never meant to be performed, although that didn't stop some people. Most famously, Manfred by Lord Byron was performed, even though the play called for a full mountain. But apparently they built it on stage, very cool. Um, but there were plays, not, not quite like Shakespeare's plays, but we also see some novels starting to come about, and the most important novel, in my opinion, from this time period is Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, which gives birth to a number of other genres that are still popular today, like the gothic horror story or science fiction. Romanticism is very short-lived. Uh, a number of the second generation of famous romantics, such as Byron and Shelley and Keats, died very young, and with them, the movement died out for the most part. Although, we'll see the transition from Romanticism isn't as jarring as the transition into it. In the United States, at this time, we have Transcendentalism and Anti-Transcendentalism. In the first group, you have Emerson and Thoreau. In the second group, you have Nathaniel Hawthorne and Herman Melville. Victorian. So the Victorian is another era named after the person in charge at that time, Queen Victoria. 
England's second longest sustained monarch. Victorian era covers an enormous amount of material and time. Uh, you have some incredible works at this time that are written. There's a real focus on class, crime, industry, imperialism, many other areas of interest in between those as well. So some famous writers you have in poetry Tennyson and the Brownings, as well as Matthew Arnold. In fiction, uh, in terms of the novel, which emerges as the dominant form, you have Charles Dickens, is a big time Victorian novelist that most people are somewhat familiar with. And I picked for one work to really focus on in this era is actually a play, even though Victorian plays didn't really become super popular until the end of the Victorian era, uh, the importance of being earnest is a great way to learn about the Victorians because it pokes fun at just about everything to do with Victorian society. Um, and it's a very, very funny, enjoyable play. So great one to check out, Oscar Wilde. There's also some good plays by Shaw Pygmalion being a very famous one. Oh, and if uh, none of those writers are familiar to you, chances are you've probably heard of Sherlock Holmes, who was also created and uh, written at this time by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. So if you're thinking of what was Victorian England like, Sherlock Holmes is not a bad spot to start to get a glimpse of, of that society. In the United States at this time, we have realism and naturalism with writers such as Jack London or Stephen Crane. Modernism. So with modernism, things start to get a little crazy. Uh, and if you look at the years that are covered here, 1900 to about 1960, it should be no surprise why things are so crazy. And there you have World War I, World War II, one of the biggest pandemics that has ever hit the globe, and the Great Depression, as well as a number of other <laughs> sort of things happening. Those are uh, not even close to all the events happening the first 60 years of this century. So because the world is in a lot of um, uncertainty and turmoil and chaos and structures seem to be falling apart, you know, monarchs are falling way to dictatorships or democracy, uh, old powers are crumbling apart, new superpowers are emerging, maybe that would help explain why the structure of, um, of the novel and of writing starts to uh, be totally reworked. You have experiments with stream of consciousness, which is an incredibly difficult form of writing where it sounds like the thoughts just coming in and out of a character's head and sometimes different characters. And if you think Virginia Woolf or Ulysses by James Joyce uh, being probably the seminal work of modernism here. And poetry undergoes an interesting split where you have some poets such as T.S. Eliot starting to write these long, incredible epics that, uh, like the wasteland, that cover many, many pages of material and have incredibly difficult words and you need footnotes to help you understand them. But then you also have minimalistic uh, single image poems, such as some of Ezra Pound's work, uh, A Station in the Metro, where it's only a couple words long. In the United States, you have authors like William Carlos Williams and William Faulkner, who are also experimenting with really similar styles to what's happening in Europe. And many famous American writers spend time in Europe at this time, and a few famous uh, English writers come to America, such as W.H. Autumn. So between the two, they're actually pretty similar. Postmodernism. Well, if you think modernism is a little tough to grasp, <laughs> postmodernism uh, makes it even more difficult in many times. It's a super fascinating uh, school of literature to study. I found sometimes that students who really aren't interested in anything I've taught all year get really into postmodernism. Uh, and that's because it really deconstructs everything else that was talked about in terms of like authorial intent and the importance of the author. You have the famous phrase, the death of the author, that what the author thinks of the book doesn't matter that it belongs to the reader. You also have deconstruction, so like the actual ideas of the novel don't matter and they can be uh, unraveled and looked at in different ways. You have a great, um, a great attempt at, at breaking traditional words, such as thinking like white images are good and dark images are bad. Uh, you can see how that's kind of problematic. So as part of postmodernism is breaking apart those sort of ingrained structures and ingrained ideas in our words and in our stories. 
Uh, there's layers of metafiction, which is fiction about fiction, as well as pastiche and parody, so where, where you're kind of emulating another work, either to honor it or maybe to make fun of it. Uh, and that takes me to one of my favorite plays, which is Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are Dead by Tom Stoppard. Spoiler for a very small part of Hamlet, uh, but by the time you get to that point, you'll, you, you won't be surprised by death. Um, <laughs> death of characters. But that play really takes the ideas of Hamlet and shows them through an entirely different perspective. It's also very similar to Samuel Beckett's Waiting for Godot, uh, which is probably the quintessential postmodern play. In the United States at this time, you have a real blossoming of postmodernism, Thomas Pynchon being a major figure in that, as well as many, many other writers. Contemporary. So for our last school of literature to look at, we're looking at nowadays. I said it was 1990 through today, but there's a lot of debate as to what contemporary is. I was born in the 90s, so I like to think that I'm still contemporary, um, which we all are. We're, we're alive right now. But whatever you mark contemporary as, whether it be the, the internet or uh, the millennium, whatever it might be, it's what's going on nowadays with writing. And it's very hard to define what's going to be famous and what's going to stick while you're living it. Uh, hindsight gives us a lot of glimpse into what just might become timeless literature and what might be forgotten. There's great novels that aren't read anymore, and there's not so great novels that are read all the time because they're in the school system, and they'll probably always be around because of that. So it's really hard to figure out who's going to be a famous writer and who, who won't be. Um, but I decided for contemporary with British and Irish literature to pick Zadie Smith, whose uh, debut novel, White Teeth, is one of the best debut novels uh, that I've ever read, and who is um, really burst onto the scene as a incredibly talented writer. And it's hard to really figure out what contemporary literature looks like, like I said, without waiting 50 years. But one thing that I've really noticed, and I think this is great, is that there is a greater representation and diversity in it. You see authors from many different backgrounds. And as I said at the beginning of the video, anywhere there's people, there's stories, there's literature. But that doesn't mean that every people's literature and stories gets the recognition that it deserves. In fact, for most of human history, that is not the case. And even today, that is not the case. But one nice thing about contemporary literature, one uplifting thing, um, a lot of it's not uplifting, but one thing that I've really been encouraged by um, and has made me have some hope for the future of writing is a greater cast of characters um, and a greater cast of writers being represented. In the United States, uh, Billy Collins is a two-time poet laureate and Julia Alvarez is a fantastic writer if you haven't read her, so pick up some of her stuff. Well, that is a very brief introduction to Irish and British literature. There is a lot of opinion in here. None of this is really set in stone, so I'd be interested to hear uh, what your thoughts on when the different genres um, and schools of literature break apart, and is there any major stuff that I left out? Obviously, I left out a lot. It's hard to cover an entire multiple cultures <laughs> literature over a thousand years. But um, yeah, let me know what you think, and uh, thank you so much for watching. Happy studying!